Okay, let's open with a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to get together and study your word and uh, see what it has for us and, and look at the wonderful plans that you have for us in the end and for eternity. Uh, we just pray that you would give us wisdom as we pray each time and give us insight into your word. And may you be glorified in, in all that we do and in our whole conversation and in our study. In Christ's name, amen. amen. We're going to continue in the seals because we only um, briefly started the seals. And then we, and the reason why I kind of went in a bit to um, Gog and Magog last week is there's so much going on right now and and because of the timing so I'm trying to keep I'm trying to keep some semblance of, of chronology going on with the end times and we've discovered or we've discovered we've been discussing the church age we discussed things that were related directly to the rapture and what it's going to look like leading up to the rapture and um, in my opinion the Gog and Magog War, the Ezekiel 38 War, will be after the rapture because it talks about wrath. And Ezekiel 38 talks about how it's going to be a time of wrath, which means it's got to be after the rapture. Now, and I brought this up before, and I'm not the only one to do this, but the question arises whether or not um, the tribulation has started when the Ezekiel 38 Gog and Magog war happens. We know the start of the tribulation starts with the first seal. And the first seal, uh, as we've looked at briefly last week, was going to be the Antichrist. So, which came first? I don't know. It's possible the Gog and Magog War could be the you know one of the very first events. It could be in between, but we know it's got to be, in my opinion, it's got to be toward the front because what we look at is we see things like, um, for instance, not just wrath that puts it at the head, puts it in the tribulation, but the duration of how long in chapter 39 they're burning the weapons. So they're burning weapons for seven years, and it's a seven-year period. And as I've mentioned before, I really don't see Jesus setting up his kingdom and allowing these weapons of mass destruction and so forth being burned as fuel going into the kingdom, into the millennium. But not only does Jesus not need it, but it's going to be that's messy. That's a question. Yeah. But when it, after the rapture, and the Antichrist comes, isn't, wasn't, didn't you say there was supposed to be peace in the beginning? Well, what happens is, is, is there is peace after fashion. Most people say it's going to be kind of a false peace. And, and I think the world is still going to be in, in calamity and chaos, but he's going to introduce kind of a false peace because who does he present himself as? He presents himself as a fake. Let's see, the, the term Antichrist is kind of, in English is kind of a little bit of a misnomer and it's kind of confusing because it sounds like the opposite of Christ. Like Jesus is this, you know, uh, in the uh, older European paintings, you know, he's got the rosy cheeks and the rosebud, rosebud uh, lips and he's beautific and, and oh, this is, you know, this is Jesus, these old pictures, which is not what he's, he's Mediterranean, you know. Yeah. More, probably more like all the complexion and he was probably like he was a carpenter. I mean, you know, so, you know, the, but, but the way people, they, they impose images on the Messiah, they do the same thing with Antichrist. So people tend to think of Antichrist as the opposite of Jesus. Well, anti is, in English, is probably a little bit of a misnomer. He's a pseudo or a fake Christ. So he's a pretender. So people are going to look at him and say, this is the dude. This guy's nice. He's going to come in here. He's going to solve all our problems. 
can solve where we've had it with these politicians and these wars and all this stuff going on. This guy's got all the answers. This guy's smart. So we're going to spend we're going to spend some time on Antichrist um, tonight uh, because we we talked a little bit about Gog and Magog, and you can tell me what you think. I I have um, I'm not married to the notion that Gog and Magog is going to be that that war is going to be um, precede Antichrist. It's a possibility because we have some some period of days, um, about 45 of them actually, that we're going to get into another time. After the tribulation, it's kind of a transitional period. And that could be the time when, you know, a power plant that's been running, burning weapons for fuel for seven years gets shut off, you know, replaced just Jesus would just speak it out of existence. Who knows what, what that's going to look like? We don't know, but we know he's going to have a big mess as it is to clean up, and he's got not going to need that stuff when he, when Jesus comes back at the second coming. So there's a period of days there. So um, and I don't know. I don't know if this will help you. But you have to remember that between the old covenant and the new covenant, that seventy weeks of Daniel goes back under the old covenant in the sense of the old, all the miracles and signs come back, if that makes sense. Because here we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We don't have the sign gifts and the healing and all of that. But, you know, it says, and in that time, the young man will start to dream dreams and have all that again because all the things that happen are going to go again because it's the last seven years of the old. So when we think about it, once the church is out, it goes back into oh, that old, yeah. um, you know, signs and yeah. gifts and wonders. It goes back to the Israel, yeah. their old... How yeah, you, I know that what you're just, talking yeah. about. So, yeah. so all, like he said, we don't know unless God right. can just do whatever. Jeremiah 30. Yeah. It's the time of Jacob's yes. trouble. So you're going to have the so, witnesses. Yeah. You're going to have people dreaming yeah. dreams and doing stuff. And but in Revelation, it sort of goes in order, kind of tells you what's going to happen, but they mm -hmm. don't put that Gog and Magog war. In right. There. Yeah. Exactly, unless they do it, it's in Revelation chapter 6, and that's, that's my thing is that we call it, it's, a, it's like Antichrist, again, what we are just talking about, really, pseudo-Christ is probably better. Um, Gog and Magog, we call it the Gog and Magog War, but we call it the Gog and Magog War. The Bible doesn't call it the Gog and Magog War. So if we see it somewhere else, we're not going to necessarily recognize it. So that's why I was trying to make the point I was last week in that, the things that are described in the sealed judgments, they kind of read like what happens as a result of war. Oh, yes. Okay. Okay, so yeah. keep that in the back of your mind. I could be wrong, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm open to being persuaded otherwise. <coughs> but let, let's go back and, and, um, and take a look at these again. We'll, we'll start in Revelation chapter 6, verse 1, and we'll examine it again. Now I watched when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say with a loud voice, like thunder, come. And we're, we should be used to, by now, um, this idea of this loud voice coming from God and um, being like thunder or being like a trumpet. It's something high volume. And I looked, and behold, a white horse and its rider had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he came out conquering and to conquer. So he's conquering. How do you conquer without arrows? See? So by cunning and so forth, he's going to come in and make a um, kind of world peace. At least he's going to be heading toward that end. So looking at, looking at him, and let, let's go on. Let me take one more quick look here and let's look at the next horse though we didn't look at the next horse really last week but here's a possibility um, when he opened eh, sorry about that I just jumped ahead there clicked the wrong button You're fired. I know I'm fired Howling. that's it I just messed up the word of God I'm now cursed right. uh, so anyway the second seal when when he opened the second seal I heard the second living creature say come and out came another horse, bright red. Its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth so that people should slay one another, and he was given a great sword. So the question comes up, you know, as always, we were looking at the Word of God, and we want to be careful with the Word of God. Is 
I think we always start off with, with literal unless we have good reason to go into symbolic. And most people say, well, this is all symbolic. But then when you look at the first horse, they say, well, no, that one's not symbolic. I mean, the first one, it's symbolic of the Antichrist, but we know it's a he and it's an actual guy. So I'm looking at the second one. I'm going, is it possible? I have to ask myself, Dave, when you're looking at the second horse there, and he's allowed to take peace from the earth and slay one another, and he's given a great sword, I got to ask, um, okay, does the Antichrist come on the scene? Maybe that's the first thing that happens during the tribulation. And then maybe right immediately after that is the rider on the red horse is Hegog, and he starts World War III. And then we see the rest of the seals happen. So that's a possibility, but we, because we know um, wars these days, you know, tend to go pretty quickly. Um, now, for instance, we are, we are, this is a, you know, we got a big, horrific, horrible petri dish going on right now with Ukraine, right? And you've got one of the most powerful countries in the world, Russia, going in after Ukraine. Ukraine's not quite a third world nation, but they're not Russia. And, and we're going into, what, three weeks now or something? So that's going to be prolonged because they've got their eyes on, on Belarus and Moldova and all kinds of places. However, as I described last week, Ezekiel 38 describes that war where um, all these nations try to go into little tiny Israel, smaller than New Jersey. Um, they get wiped out kind of quick. They never make it down into Jerusalem, for instance, before God takes them out. And there's uh, fire and brimstone from the heavens and so forth. So the question comes as to whether or not, um, as we're looking at the second horse, could that be um, finally Gog and Magog finally moving in on Jerusalem. So Antichrist comes on the scene um, after the rapture. He wants to clean up the world. It's a mess and everybody's about done with what's going on. Ukraine is going on now, right? We're really close to um, a world war right now. And they're trying to draw us into it, it seems like. And they're trying to draw NATO into it. Well, um, Imagine, and you probably don't have to imagine too hard, imagine if, if um, in our current situation, if a man of peace came along and um, presented himself as Messiah, or everybody thought he was Messiah, and he's going to come along, and he says, that's it, we're, we're done with this nonsense, because we've got stuff, skirmishes going on with Iran. Iran has just launched a dozen missiles at one of our bases in Iraq, and... Um, Iran keeps lobbing missiles and sending drones at Israel. We got this stuff going on with Ukraine and more nations now kind of being drawn into this. So somebody comes along and they're, they're going to be a peacemaker. So he's here, but he hasn't really had a chance to do much yet. Next thing you know, God decides to move toward Israel. And that's what kicks off the time of Jacob's trouble, really. This right now, we see going on in Ukraine, it might be the setting of the stage, as we, as we said, but it's not the Gog and Magog War. But it's not a very far leap to go down across the Black Sea over there and go ahead and move on to Israel. So those types of events can happen rather quickly, but it's going to end quickly. So we see these events that happen in the seal judgments, and I think it's possible that you could have this type of a situation where you know, you've got war, and that's that's the second seal. Um, so could their writers then be, okay, if we're talking about bowls and seals, and these are all judgments of God, mm -hmm. and I don't think it really matters what the writer is. They're all creatures bent on his, his will. So, like, I have next to three, that red one, it's war, and the next black horse is, I'm going to get ahead of you, is famine, and the next one is death. Mm -hmm. But they're all created beings for him, like when you had the Passover and the, you know, the Egypt and the plagues, mm -hmm. okay, it was an angel of death that went and did that, it was still... Well, yeah, and, and, and God does as he pleases, he's sovereign God, and even against um, Pharaoh, it says repeatedly in 
those passages in Genesis and Exodus and so forth, we, we remember all the stories before the Exodus, and God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Yeah. So well, I'm just saying, it's, it's, sometimes I think when we read these, we kind of disassociate the fact that this is God's judgment, and mm -hmm. these created beings, whatever, whether they're beasts or angels or whatever, they, well, we still have to have that argument, but we still, you know, whatever these beings are, they are his, they're the angel of death or the angel of faith, you know what I mean? They're his, yeah. they're created by him for his will, for his glory. Even, even bringing it into home here where you're looking at the Gog and Magog war in Ezekiel 38, we looked at those first handful of verses and what did we read concerning God and what he tells Gog. He's, God, he's telling Gog, God is telling Gog, um, you know, I, I will hook you by the jaw, I will draw you in, I will lead you by the nose, I will bring you and I'm going to judge the nations, I will judge you on the hills of Jerusalem, that kind of a thing. So God is the one doing all this for his purposes. So. Yeah, I mean, those are all important things to look at. And um, look, but let's before we run off in that, I don't mind running off in that direction. I am not in a hurry, as you know, for these studies. I want to be thorough, and I uh, want to make sure we we cover all this. The only the only place I'm I'm kind of slow to go in because it's another completely different study, and it takes a, a lot of time. Would be spend too much time in Daniel because you can get lost in Daniel. And then we'd never get back to Revelation, right? Daniel is the Revelation, book of Revelation of the Old Testament in so many different ways. Um, and we've looked at it before, and we dragged some of those passages into it, and we're going to continue to do that. But um, if, we're, if we ever want to go back into Daniel again, we can go back into Daniel, Daniel and spend you know, some more thorough time in it. But, um, but meantime, let's, let's look at some of the passages that describe a little bit about Antichrist, the pedigree of Antichrist. What is he supposed to be like? There's a lot of questions. There's a lot of disagreement about the Antichrist, a lot of confusion. So, you know, where those are, we want to, you know, kind of clear some of that up. And, um, you know, not, not everything that um, I'm, I'm presenting to you, I, I don't want you to take my word for it as always I want you to do some research and decide whether or not um, you know it is as um, be pre as presented here or if it's something else speak up let us know um, but we know what happens very often is we've discovered is that there are many foreshadows we talk about Antiochus now Antiochus was described as the abomination that makes desolate in Daniel chapter 9. And then Antiochus came along and um, he defiled the temple. He's, he erected a statue of Zeus. He slaughtered a pig in the, in the temple and all of that. Yet a couple hundred years later, flash forward to Jesus in the first century. He says, so when you see, when you see the abomination that makes desolate, Wait a minute, I thought that happened 200 years ago. So there's a lot of foreshadowing things that happen. So we see um, types of Christ, we see types of Antichrist. So sometimes when you're, you're in a conversation with somebody and they want to argue, they'll say, no, that was this guy back in history, that already happened. Well, it did, but is it the complete fulfillment? Are there not ripples that through time? And then you have the final fulfillment fulfills all of the things that were stated. Um, Folks, again, will try to say Antichrist, uh, the abomination of desolation, was, was Nero, or, you know, pick whoever, in 70 AD. Well, was he? Did he set up a beast system with a numeric system that made the whole world follow this? You know, there's a, you know was there an image set up in the temple? Well, no, not hardly, since they burned it down before anybody had a chance to erect anything in the temple. Um, so not quite a complete fulfillment. So that means that there's something coming after 70 AD that was yet future, that Jesus described as the worst time ever leading up to it, and the worst time ever, there'll be never never anything as bad after. So it can't be 70 AD because World War I and World War II were leagues worse than 70 AD. 
So we got to look at weigh all these things in, throw all this information, throw it all on the scale and, and weigh it, measure it carefully um, and under the lens of scripture. So introduction done. Now we're, let's get into it. I don't know. Is it done now? Is it done? Okay. Any more questions, comments? Okay. Um, hey, real quick, find toward the end of your Old Testament, Zechariah again. Zechariah is one that I would advise you to, to sometime spend a little time in that if you're interested in end time stuff, and I think you are or you wouldn't be here. But... Zechariah has a lot of information concerning the very end. Just the very last one of them? The Just old. about. Sorry. Zechariah what? Second? Second to last. Malachi's last. Oh, okay. yeah. Zechariah what? Zechariah 11. Let's start with verse 17. Woe to the worthless shepherd who leaves the flock a sword shall be against his arm and against his right eye. His arm shall completely wither and his right eye shall be totally blinded. Now, most theologians will say that this is a, you know, a proclamation, a, a description of the Antichrist and something that's supposed to happen to the Antichrist. Um, We know that regardless of his attempts to bring about world peace, there'll be maybe a pseudo peace, but he won't be able to keep it together. Something's going to happen to where somebody's going to try to take him out, an assassination attempt. Um, there are good arguments saying that uh, he will actually become killed, and it'll be a Christ-like type of a resurrection. Um, if, if he does actually resurrect from the dead, it'll be because God did it, because it's by his decree that he decides it fits his purpose, but not because Satan's got the power to make alive, um, especially of himself. Because if, if he were, uh, if he were to die, the Antichrist is just a man like Judas, but he becomes possessed eventually by Satan, um, at least by the middle of the tribulation. De he might even have a league of demons living in him, at least one chief demon, um, certainly living in him um, up to that time. Uh, some of the things that are described of him, I don't see him as being um, able to do some of the things that he's supposed to do out of human strength. Or ability so demonic activity is going to surround him because he's going to be Satan's man so there's a description here that looks like at some point it takes him out so this coming world leader he has 33 titles actually in the Old Testament so Antichrist is a term that's really most mostly a New Testament term we read that in first John um, in the Old Testament, he's, he's got 33 titles, 13 in the New Testament. Um, one of these, the prince that shall come, comes from Daniel 9, verses 26 and 27, and we've read that, in which the people of the prince that shall come would destroy the city and the sanctuary. Um, the fulfillment in history when the Roman legions under Titus destroyed Jerusalem um, that was 70 A.D. Um, as I said, he didn't do. He was not a complete fulfillment of all the things, especially as uh, Jesus described. Um, most, I'll say many, maybe most Bible scholars view the future prince that shall come as Roman or European because of the reference to the Romans. That looks like a, a reflexive reference to the Romans in Daniel chapter 9, verse 26. Um, I've heard, and I, I, t 
tend to agree with the fact that if the Jews are going to accept him as a possible Messiah, that he has to be Jewish. He has to be a Jew. I agree with that. And we're going to look at some verses in here, the reason why. I think Roman would be more descriptive of um, the part of the world where he, he lives. He's also called the Assyrian. But if you, if you, I, somewhere around, I've got images, I've got charts too, but if you, you look at that whole region, you've got the, the Roman Empire and its territories. In the Assyrian Empire, you can overlay and they overlap tremendously depending on what empire was in charge. It's like the Ottoman Empire covered a lot of the same territory. So you can call somebody a Roman by virtue of what territory they came out of, and you can call them an Assyrian, and you can call them an Ottoman too by virtue of the territory that they came out of. But it, yeah, I, I, you know, you talk to most Jews, and by most I mean better than 95% of Jews, um, they say, you know, his title is Messiah, he's pseudo-Messiah, he's supposed to come and present himself as the one who came up from the line of David, he's got to be a Jew. So a lot of people try to say, oh, I think the Messiah, when he or the, the Messiah, the Antichrist, when he comes, he's going to be, you know, a Muslim. I, I can't imagine too many Jews at all who would accept <laughs> a Muslim, <laughs> Muslim Messiah, you know, yeah. as the... Um, have an ethnic, ethnically Jewish pope. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and well, he's so, Roman, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay, so he's got to be at least part Jew. He, I, I agree that he's got to be at least part Jew because look at the title. Well, not only that, but let's look at some of the other titles that he's got. And um, you could tell a lot about him by some of his titles, but we'll look at some of the ones, too, that describe where it sounds. Sounds like they're talking Jew to me. Um... So we know also, we, uh, we, we spent some time, okay, Matthew 24, 24, Jesus warned that if it's possible, um, even the very elect could be deceived. So that's how cunning and treacherous he's going to be. Uh, also, 2 Thessalonians 2, it looks like um, the way it reads is that the Messiah has to rapture his church before the false Messiah comes along and reveals himself. We read that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. So there's the timing of him and how that's got, that's got to work, but look at some of the titles here. I can give you some references, some titles and some references in, on your own if, if you want to spend some time and visit all those passages, you can. Um, but we're going to look at a lot of them here. Uh, again, the Antichrist, he's called the Antichrist. He's called that in 1 John 2.22. First John what? Two twenty-two. Um, he's called the man of sin, um, the son of perdition, in Second Thessalonians two three. Um, and in the same passage, Second Thessalonians two, verse eight, he's called the lawless one. And in Revelation eleven seven, he's called the beast. We have, uh, he's called the bloody and deceitful man in Psalm 5, 6. He is referred to as the wicked one in Psalm 10, verses 2 and 4. He's called the man of the earth in Psalm 10, verse 18. The same psalm. And if you go up into Psalm 52, verse 1, he's referred to as the mighty man. And in Psalm 55, 3, he's called the enemy. Psalm 74, 8 to 10, he's called the adversary. Um, Psalm 110, 6, the head over many countries, which is interesting. Psalm 140, verse 1, he's called the violent man. So he might try to appear as a man of peace initially. But that's just the facade that he puts on, right? Isaiah 10, I just spoke about this. Isaiah 10, verses 5 and 12, he's called the Assyrian. Now, the, the Assyrian is not to say the same thing as he is Syrian. Syria is the country that we know of now. 
It's been in existence a long time and its borders have flexed and changed and moved depending on who's in charge and who conquers over them or who they conquer over time. But the Assyrian Empire is different and like I said, it was much broader at one time. It covered uh, a lot of... So we could, in our minds, we could equate this with like Paul saying, I'm a Jew trained here, whatever, but then because he was born a Roman, he got to go and do all of those things as a Roman. Yeah, when they found out they had him chained up and were getting ready to f flog him and beat him, and found out he's a Roman citizen, oh my gosh, you can try to get me fired here? I want to be in yeah. trouble. He's a citizen. So yeah, he's a Jew. The same thing. So exactly. somewhere in his lineage, he's Jewish, but because of his birth or nationality or whatever, he's also how he's be... associated his citizenship, whatever. Yeah, okay, yep. that's how he's going to be. Because he's also going to be the um, what's the Middle Eastern one, the Mahdi or whatever. The Mahdi. Yeah. It, they uh, probably when you look at the descriptions of that, that's kind it's of an interesting be study. It looks and weird and... fits in because really before him, he's a world leader and accepted and beloved by the whole world. At some point, he's got to be so persuasive that he persuades the Muslims to endear themselves to him. Yeah. And the Roman Catholic Church and the Mormons yeah. and the Buddhists yeah. and the Krishnas and whoever else, they've all got to say, this guy's... Well, because he's going to be doing miracles and whatnot, too, so that's... The Bible. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Kind of wild, huh? So that's why I kind of laugh when people look and, and they absolutely hate, you know, uh, the flavor of the month president or something. And they say, he's the Antichrist. Well, he's supposed to be much loved. I used to, I, I, when Trump was in office, we heard that a lot. You know, Trump, oh, he's got to be the Antichrist. He's the guy, you know. Well, why? You know, it's because people hate him or whatever. It's like, well, that's, okay. Um, that's the opposite of the way he's going to be presented to the world, you know. So... No, but we heard this about Kissinger, we heard this about Kennedy, we heard this about Reagan, we heard this, you know, so you, you name it, you just. So it comes out of a uh, lack of understanding of some of these verses, in these passages here that I mentioned that describe how he's going to be and how he's going to present himself, which is part of the reason why we're going into this, because there's a lot of information about who he's going to be and how he's going to present himself. So in Isaiah 14.4, he is also presented as the king of Babylon. Now here's the thing about Babylon, and that's another study that we'll get into when we get to those chapters in the book of Revelation. But a lot of people will look at some of the end times descriptions in the book of Revelation and they'll say silly things like, America is Babylon. Because you can find, because you, of the similarities you can find, right? Um, but that's like saying that Larry and I are the same guy because we both wear glasses. We're both white guys. We're both balding. We both have beards. And awesome wives. And awesome wives. Right? So, so we're both, so we're both the same. Yeah, sorry. You know, and that's without looking at the differences. And it's the differences, the distinctions that make the difference here. The, mark my words. There, there might some point be, in Babylon, in Iraq, there might be a headquarters somewhere where something is headquartered up. But the Babylonian systems, and there's two of them. There's not just one. There's a religious Babylonian system and there's a governmental economic gov uh, Babylonian system. Those are both global. It's not just stationed. It's, it's the United States. It's Egypt. It's Israel. It's in Iraq. Those are global systems that operate like the Babylon that the writers of the Bible would comprehend and as uh, was communicated to them and as they were communicating. So we, again looking back in history at what Babylon meant to them at the time they wrote it, how we could um, look at it through um, lenses of the scripture in today's eyes and understand what they mean by Babylon. That was the world system at the time, civilized world at the time, then not knowing all the whole world that we know now. So scripture plainly teaches that There'll be another Babylon which will eclipse the importance and glories of the one of the past, and that Babylon will be one of the headquarters of the Antichrist, like I said, it could be in the actual Babylon. Good chance of that. Um, here, the um, statement is he will have three. Jerusalem will be um, probably his religious headquarters. Um, Rome, his political, and Babylon... His commercial, 
possible. For those who desire to uh, anticipate our future ex expositions, we recommend them to make a study of Isaiah 10, 11, 13, and 14, um, Jeremiah 49, 51, Zechariah 5, and finally Revelation 18. And I believe I got that note right there from um, Dr. Chuck Missler. So he splits their headquarters up into three different sections. Possible, worth taking a look at. Um, he's also known as the son of the morning in Isaiah 14, 12. He'll be known as the spoiler in Isaiah 16, verses 4 and 5. Interestingly enough, he's known as the nail in Isaiah 22, 25. Um, he is the branch of the terrible ones in Isaiah 25, 5. So he's got a lot of colorful descriptors. Um, one that we should all be familiar with is, and this speaks to his Jewishness, I think, Larry, is Ezekiel 21, verses 25 to 27. He's known as the, prophet, the profane and wicked prince of Israel. The profane and wicked prince of Israel, in Ezekiel 21, 25 to 27, it says, And you, profane, wicked prince of Israel, whose day has come when iniquity shall have an end, thus says the Lord God, remove the diadem, that's the crown, take off that crown, this shall not be the same, exalt him that is low and abase him that is high, I will overturn, overturn, overturn it, and it shall be no more until he come, whose right it is, and I will give it him. So that's interesting. That speaks to his Jewishness. Because you're not going to call a Muslim that wicked prince of Israel, right? You're not going to call a white guy from the United States that wicked prince of Israel. But again, he's also known as um, the Assyrian. So he probably may be born out of or comes out of a nation that is in former Assyria, but he's a Jew. Hmm? Iraq. Iraq, Iraq could be very easily. Um, it's interesting what's going on right now is uh, Russian Jew, Jewry, former Soviet Jewry from all over the place and uh, from Russia and from Ukraine, for instance, coming down into Israel right now by massive, massive numbers, and thousands. 4,100 something now. I mean, officially, those are the numbers. Yeah. So there's still more coming in. Well, yeah, they're, they're flooding in. All right, so he's also called. The little horn, and I think we've heard that before, and that we run into this in um, Daniel chapter 7, verses 8 to 11, and verses 21 to 26. Also up in chapter 8, verses 9 to 12, and verses 23 to 25. So the little horn refers to the lowly political origin of the Antichrist, okay? And describes him as he is before he attains governmental supremacy. Remember the little horn comes up and he, he takes over? He's also known in Daniel 9.26 as the prince that shall come. In Daniel 11.21 he's known as the vile person. He's known in, uh, up in, in verse 36 of the same chapter, Daniel 11, as the willful king. In Zechariah, um, the book we were just in, he's the idle shepherd. We just read that. The angel of the bottomless pit in Revelation 9, 11. Um, it, it's, and some of that's heavily disputed, so I'm not going to call that gospel. Um, 9, 11, it refers to his name in Hebrew tongue as uh, Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue has his name Apollyon. So that may or may not be him. That may be in the, in some type of angel, demonic, creature, chief demon that we're not even familiar with yet. So uh, that's worth research and worth discussion and stuff, and so I would encourage you doing that because that's a fun description right there, fun uh, discussion. Um, some of his descriptors are um, how he'll be, it seems like he's going to be an intellectual genius. So it's not our current president. And... <laughs> and uh, 
Daniel 7.20, he's represented as a horn that had eyes. So that's a double symbol. The, the horn prefigures his, his strength, but the eyes speak of intelligence. That's a Hebraism that is often used. We, we saw that regarding some, some of the angels, right? The seraphim and the cherubim, they have eyes all around or whatever. They're very intelligent. They, there's not much they miss. They see everything. Um, Daniel 8.23 is referred to as a king of fierce countenance. The countenance is the face, right? Who shall understand dark sentences. So riddles and rhymes and things. So uh, whatever is cryptic, he'll understand them. That which baffles others shall be simple to him. The Hebrew word here translated dark sentences is the same as the one rendered hard questions in 1 Kings 10.1, where we read of the Queen of Sheba coming to Solomon with her hard questions in order to test his wisdom. So it's also the word that's used in uh, Samson's riddle in Judges 14. So it's interesting. So he's going to be able to unscrew the inscrutable. Uh, Ezekiel 28. I've got this passage in here that will speak of him too. The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, say to the prince of Tyre, this is the Lord God, because your heart is proud and you have said, I am a God, I sit in the seat of the gods in the heart of the seas, yet you are but a man and no God, though you make your heart like the heart of a God. You are indeed wiser than Daniel. That's saying something. No secret is hidden from you, but your wisdom and your understanding, you have made wealth for yourself. By your, by your wisdom and your understanding, you have made wealth for yourself and have gathered gold and silver into your treasuries. So now we know how the source of his, how he gets his wealth. So he's going to have treasuries and he's going to come from wealth. So that's important to get out of that too. By your great wisdom in your trade, you have increased your wealth and your heart has become proud in your wealth. So he's going to have so much wealth, he's going to be really egotistical about it, right? Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you make your heart like the heart of a God, therefore, behold, I will bring foreigners upon you, the most ruthless of the nations, and they shall draw their swords against you. Maybe that's how he loses an eye and an arm, right? Uh, against the beauty of your wisdom and defile your splendor. They shall thrust you down into the pit, and you shall die the death of the slain in the heart of the seas. Will you still say, I am a God, in the presence of those who kill you? So God is mocking him here. Though you are but a man and no God, in the hands of those who slay you, you shall die the death of the uncircumcised. That's a jibe there. Why is that? Who would that matter to you? So what? I'm uncircumcised. If I die the death of the uncircumcised, that's an insult to who? That's going to be an insert, insult to a Jew, exactly right. So you shall die the death of the uncircumcised. Ha ha, take that. Well, that's going to be insulting to a Jew only. Um, by the hand of foreigners, for I have spoken, declares the Lord God. Um, apparently, he will be an oratorical genius. Again, not, not our current president. <laughs> In Daniel 7.20, we are told that he has a mouth that spake very great things. And Revelation 13.2 declares that his mouth is as the mouth of a lion, which is a symbolic expression of telling of the majesty and awe producing the effects of his voice. The voice of the lion excels that of any other beast. Okay, so the voice of a, a lion. Also, um, he will be a political genius. Clearly not current president. In the early stages of his career, he appears as a little horn, or power, but it's not long before he ascends in the topmost rung. Daniel 11.21 tells us, he shall come in peaceably, there again, with the, he carries the um, bow, but no arrows. So Daniel 11.21, you could cross-reference with your Revelation 6.1. So, he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. So again, with the tongue. He will be a commercial genius. Um, we have here, let's see. And through his policy also, he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand in Daniel 8.25. Um, under his regime, 
Everything will be nationalized and none will be able to buy or sell without his permission. So he sets that system up in Revelation 13, verse 17. All commerce will be under his personal control, and this will also be used for his own aggrandizement. The wealth of the world will be at his disposal. Uh, Psalm 52, 7 says, Lo, this is the man that made not God his strength, but trusted in the abundance of his riches and strengthened himself in his substance. In Daniel 11, 38, it says, But in his estate shall be honor, or shall he honor the God of forces, which is uh, an allusion to Satan, and to God whom his fathers knew not. Daniel eleven forty three says, But he shall have power over the treasuries of gold and silver, and <coughs> over all the precious things of Egypt. So how does that happen? Um, he's going to be a military genius. His genius is such that uh, he shall, quote, he shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper in practice and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. Um, Daniel 8, 24. He shall go forth conquering and to conquer. We just read in Revelation 6, 2. He will sweep everything before him so that the world will exclaim who is like unto the beast, who is able to make war with him in Revelation 13, 4. He's spoken of as the man who will shake kingdoms and make the earth to tremble, Isaiah 14, 6. Okay, we've got a few more here to cover about the Antichrist. You getting the picture of this guy yet? Uh, he's not going to be tri one to be trifled with and, and not like anything we've seen before that we say, Oh, that, that guy could be the Antichrist. No. no, nobody's really come along like this yet. Um, he will be a governmental genius. In Revelation 13, 1 and 2, it says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea. And the sea being generally referring to people, uh, an ocean of people, right? So um, he's going to come up out of a, a mass of people, large numbers. Having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns, ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, and his seat, and great authority. Here we find the forces of the Roman, Grecian, and Medo-Persian, and the Babylonian empires combined. So he's going to have all that ability in, him, in himself as a running a government. So the ten kings of the Roman Empire in its, in its ultimate form shall give their kingdoms unto him, it says in Revelation 17, 17. Um, he's going to be a religious genius. He will proclaim himself God, sitting in the temple, shall show himself forth that he is God, 2 Thessalonians 2, 4. Even the very elect would be deceived by him um, if God didn't directly protect them. Um, all the world wondered after the beast is in Revelation 13, 3. His final triumph shall be that wounded by a sword, he shall live again. And that we find that Revelation 13, 3 and also in Zechariah eleven seventeen, as we read first off. And they shall worship his very image in Revelation 13, um, verses 14 and 15. So again, he's going to be at least partially a Jew. Ezekiel 28, um, you shall die the death of the uncircumcised, you know, as an insult, implying he's Jewish. Um, again, Ezekiel 21, 25 to 27, where he's referred to, thou profane, wicked prince of Israel. And also Daniel 11, verses 36 and 37, about neither shall he regard the God of his fathers. Um, A couple other passages to look at, really, speaking of, of this false Messiah, and then we'll, we'll move on with this and, and uh, look at the rest of Revelation 6, believe it or not. But this is kind of key, don't you think? Or we can discuss this a little bit more before we move on in Revelation 6. We, you know, it's up to you. In John 5, 43... In speaking of the false Messiah, the Lord Jesus referred to him as follows. 
another shall come in his own name. In the Greek, there are four different words, all translated in another in um, our English versions. One of them is employed but once, and the second is uh, employed five times. So, so these um, need not detain this now. The remaining two are used frequently and with clear distinction between the first. Alos refers or signifies another of the same kind or genus. Um, in the verses where that's used, uh, if you're if you're curious and you want to play the video back and find out where that word alos means that signifies another of the same genus, it's Matthew 10, 23, also 13, 24, 26, 71, and there's a couple others. The second is is um, is uh, the word heteros, which means another of a totally different kind, um, like in Mark 16, 12. Luke 14, 31, Acts 7, 18, and Romans 7, 23. So the striking thing is that the word used by our Lord in John 5, 5 43 is the word alos, um, another of the same genus, not heteros, uh, another of a different order, is, is this. Christ, the son of Abraham, the son of David, had presented himself to Israel and they rejected him. But another... Alos of the same Abrahamic stock should come to them, and him they would receive. So if the coming Antichrist were to be a Gentile, the Lord would have employed the word heteros, not alos. The fact that he used alos shows that he shall be a Jew. Actually, that's A.W. Pink, his observations. Worth considering, right? Another good argument for him being a Jew. Um, and, then, and then the other one again, that we've already mentioned is the mock Christ, the fake Christ will be received by Israel, the Jews will be deceived by him, they will believe that he is indeed the long expected Messiah, they will accept him as such. If the pseudo Christ succeeds in palming himself off to the Jews as their true Messiah, he would have to be a Jew, for it is unthinkable that they would be deceived by any Gentile. So that's the Antichrist, the Antichrist pedigree. Questions, comments. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come, and out came another horse, bright red. Its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth so that people should slay one another, and he was given a great sword. When he opened the third seal, I heard the, living, the third living creature say, Come, and I looked, and behold, a black horse, and its rider had a pair of scales in his hand. What is this? What's the meaning of this? Famine? Yeah, and I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and wines. This speaks to shortage. And denarius is about a day's wages at that time. And five dollars a gallon for gas. And five dollars a gallon for gas, yeah. Do not harm the gasoline. Very hard to come by. So just like the, you know, like we use the terms with, with Babylon or whatever, speaking of things in the past that were relatable, same thing here. Denarius, I mean, he's not going to use dollars. He's going to speak in the language and in the terms of the day that they understood. Um, so um, scarcity is what it's all about. And this type of thing particularly happens during times of war. Um, our current situation is not strictly, here in the United States, it's not strictly because of war, not what's going on over there, because um, that was stuff was going on before the Ukrainian nonsense happened, right? Mm. So... When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come, and I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and its rider's name was Death, and Hades followed him. And they were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, with famine, and with pestilence, and by wild beasts of the earth. This gets debated a little bit, time, a little bit um, of the time, and, and there's... 
a fair amount of silliness that goes on out there on a regular basis that this verse disputes, these two verses dispute, and that is that I think we're already in Revelation 6. Ooh, hey guys, what do you think? You know, you're on Facebook or whatever and you get this. Ooh, do you think, I think we might be in Revelation chapter 8 now. And I'm, I'm usually kind of going, hold, hold on, time out. We're at the fourth of the earth in this world population is close to 2 billion people. We're the 2 billion dead people. Pause. Crickets, <laughs> you know. These things all happen in order. And also... Some people say, I say, well, it says, it says a quarter of the earth, not people. People will say that too. Like that could be like, you know, global warming and stuff taking out the earth. Well, the passage, it talks about killing. You don't usually use the word um, killing where it comes to um, the earth, but it's with a sword. You don't usually take a sword to the earth, plants, and animals. Famine, pestilence by wild beasts of the earth. So, Part of the cause of death is sword and so forth. But you've got to understand, too, in, in times of war and there's scarcity and um, disease and stuff is going on, the, wild, the animals are going to go kind of wild, too. Now, this is going to be, this might be something very unique and something that um, through God's judgment and opening uh, war and death upon the world isn't, doesn't necessarily mean that the wild beasts um, are going to, strictly speaking, naturally go after mankind in any great massive numbers. Um, it could be God's judgment that he just sets them loose and, loose and stirs them up against mankind too. I don't, we don't know. Um, I don't intend to find out firsthand. But it's going to be bad enough that it's named here, it's mentioned here, that the animals start going crazy and going after people. Enough that um, by the time... All is said and done here, you're going to have a quarter of the earth wiped out. And that's a lot of people. So, when you open the fifth seal, I saw under the altar uh, the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete, who were to be killed as they themselves had been. So a, a question about this is how is that one of the seals, how is that judgment of God? Because they waited and they were there. So while they're getting... But how's that judgment upon the earth? I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just saying, well, asking for clarification. Interesting, isn't it? It's unique. It sets up, sets, they stands up differently. They have to wait for their vengeance. If you're talking about that's true. But I, I had a I, you went too fast. I had a comment on the last one. Okay, what's your comment on the last one? We can cover them the both. Death. Yeah, the death and the pale horse and the, uh -huh. and the death and the. Because I'm in Ezekiel right now, and those are the very same four things that he uses all back then as his judgment as well. Yeah. And he uses them all different. I mean, some of them are by sword, some of them are some of them by sword and pestilence, some of them are whatever. But even back in like Ruth and Naomi, there was pestilence in the land. Back in Egypt, there was pestilence. You know, there was mm -hmm. famine back in the. So it's those pattern. Things, you know, yeah. So here it's the same. I mean, he's going to use all the same things that he has in the past because it's very typical. It's a pattern of his judgment, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. So. Yes, it is. So, really, my my uh, main thought, my primary thought, I mean, I think there's a little truth in uh, several things you can lend here to this passage, verses 9 to 11, Revelation 6. But judgment... Um, these people are, the people of the earth are responsible for the death of the martyrs and the judgment of the nations and so forth. What's further coming out is this all is going to stir God up and his emotions and so forth. And then there's also the prayers of the saints and the incense and on the altar and all these types of things are all things that are going to be stirring up God in, uh, against the world in, in judgment. I think that is going to be um, part of what goes on here. What do you think? 
Does that make some sense at all? So six seal though, we've got cosmic disturbances. Um, when he opened the sixth seal, I looked and behold, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth. The moon became like blood. Now here's the thing. What would, does God, I mean he could, does God do you think reach down and blacken the sun and turn the moon to look like blood or actually turn the moon into blood or how is this being described? I looked, there was a great earthquake. The sun became black as sackcloth. The full moon became like blood. So like ash, blocking out the light. Lots of ash and stuff and, and dirt and debris. Um, were you around up in, in Mariposa like at the time when Mount St. Helens went up? I was actually moving to Seattle. Oh, okay. A couple... We moved to Seattle in 80, didn't it blow up? Yeah. In 80, yeah. But, no, I didn't see. But was it in the, the ash was, the ash the was still falling down, but, it, but uh, talk about the sun looking like sackcloth. It kind of did. I mean, oh. it was kind of shady looking and yeah. things. It was because of all the ash up in the sky. And, and sometimes, um, you know, if you're in the middle of a forest fire or something, even the sun will look like blood at that time because the smoke, it'll be, yeah. you know, red and blazing looking and all that. So, and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit. When shaken by a gale, the sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up and every mountain and island was removed from its place. So, this is going to be something that great stellar and cosmic calamity um, now this is an example of where we've we've got hyperbolic language because if if the sky vanished like a scroll that's being rolled up literally and completely we know that we, that is figurative language that's hyperbole because how long will we be breathing that way you know or we'd be drifting off the earth or whatever mm -hmm. So it's speaking hyperbole, exaggerative language about just how calamitous it's going to be with all the stuff flying in. It's going to create all kinds of cosmic disturbances that's going to be quite horrific. It also says the kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone, slave and free, hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and rocks, Fallen us and hide, um, hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from, what? The wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come and who can stand? So this is the kings of the earth and everybody are, are making this observation. The scripture says nothing to dissuade them that, that, that it is actually wrath, that that's what's going on. And I only make this note because it frequently comes up no, I believe in a pre-wrath rapture. And I usually say uh, I believe in pre-wrath too because pre-rapture is as pre-wrath as you can get. But this shows that there's wrath even right here in the middle of the sealed judgments. So uh, it's not just a matter of uh, sometime up in the middle of the tribulation und some undefined period. Now, this is some photos here of... Uh, for instance, deep underground military bunkers, the ones that have been allowed to be photographed. We're, we have crisscrossed under this country and various European countries. Um, tunnels that are crisscrossed and stocked with food and so forth. And these aren't places just for the military, but even the old Denver airport is tunneled thoroughly underneath. So, uh, you know, we're probably not going to be invited. I've never had that invite or got a key card or anything into that, but you can bet various congressmen, senators, wealthy people, and so forth are going to be given admittance um, into these places. And there's rumors of different other locations of where these entrances are. But um, stuff hits the fan at the very end, and um, some people are going to start getting some phone calls about where to go. This Cheyenne Mountain, there's their entrance, Cheyenne Mountain Complex. Where is that? What state? Colorado. Yeah, Colorado. Colorado. 
this is a that is a big blade that carves those tunnels and those were workers. Um, there's one of the machines that's an old one actually but that blades on the front of it and they just tunnel through and they bore a tunnel system throughout kind of crazy this one here I mentioned last week that is one that we're looking forward to we don't know when this is going to happen exactly Isaiah 17 1 behold Damascus will cease from being a city and it will be be a uh, ruinous heap uh, that's another one that we're looking at happening really at the very head of the um, tribulation period. And that might even be something that um, kicks off the attack. Right now, Iran has um, a lot of military structures and equipment staged right near and in Damascus. Israel's been hitting them pretty heavily lately, so imagine if they hit the wrong thing or somebody else hit it and made it look like the Jews, and then you have your impetus for, okay, that's it, we're going to go in after Israel. So that kind of thing could happen too. Who knows exactly how that's going to happen. So, questions? A lot of stuff going on, huh? <laughs> Processing? Any questions about the Antichrist? So what we'll do is um, we'll move. We'll continue to move on. We'll move on next week. If you want, let's close in prayer. Mm -hmm. Lord, thanks again for your word and for these um, these folks hungry to know more about you, hungry to know more about Jesus Christ and how Jesus is going to take the seals, the title deed of all creation, and bring it back, Lord. That we have paradise lost. Jesus is going to give us paradise found. And it's going to be all about Jesus. All of us surrounding his throne. Worshipping. And Lord we so look forward to that. And help us meantime to be diligent. To share the gospel. As we're in the supermarket. And at work. Wherever we happen to be. And get an opportunity. Help us to see those opportunities. When they come up. Give us wisdom to know what to say to people. And how to share. As, as, we, uh, as we go out into the world. And we'll be so careful to give you all the glory for whatever comes out of it. In Jesus' name we pray and give you thanks. Amen. Amen.